I ever feel like uh, most training programs, they're just, well, I don't know, kind of useless. Yeah, I know what you mean. Like you leave the room and you've learned all this stuff, right. but does it actually like change how you do your job? Yeah. Today's deep dive, we are tackling that very problem. It's a really common one. I think a lot of times we focus so much on just like totally. cramming information into people's heads. Yeah. You know, instead of actually like um, yes. changing how they perform you know, in the real world. Exactly. So to help us unpack this whole thing, we are um, diving into the work of instructional design guru Guy Wallace and his book, Conducting Performance-Based Instructional Analysis. Great book. Don't worry. It's way more interesting than it sounds. It is. It is. The guy, he's all about this idea of high-stakes performance. So we're talking like jobs where the stakes are high and even small improvements can make a huge E difference. Huge, yeah. And he actually gives this uh, this amazing example about a call center. I think you know the one I'm talking about. Oh, yes. With the 3,500 salespeople, right? Yeah, yeah. Where their daily goal was $750 in sales each. Yeah. But, you know, less than half were hitting that target. Right, so you think about the impact if they could like close that gap, you mm -hmm. know, we're talking like potentially millions of dollars in revenue. Absolutely. Millions. Easily. It's like mind blowing. So how does Wallace suggest we approach this? Well, he talks about this thing called the modular curriculum development framework. MCD. MCD, exactly. And don't worry, we'll unpack what that yeah. actually means. Yes, yes, we will break it down. But essentially it's... Um... It's a framework, essentially a six phase framework okay. for building training programs that, you know, that actually work. Right. And the really cool part, I think, is that it embeds analysis throughout the entire process. Oh, okay. So you're constantly checking in, making sure that the training's still relevant, still impactful. Okay, so let's break down this uh, MCD framework a little bit. Like, what are those six phases? Uh, and how do they actually ensure that the training, like, <laughs> hits the mark? Sure. So phase one is all about project planning and kickoff. Okay. Kind of like laying the groundwork, right? Yeah. You're defining the scope of the project, oh. identifying the key stakeholders, outlining the those big picture goals for the training. So far, so good. Sounds like a sensible starting point. Mm -hmm. You know, you're making sure everyone's on the same page from the get go. That's exactly. But here's where it gets really interesting. The second phase is analysis. Right. And it's not just a one time thing, you know, at the beginning. Right. right. And this is what sets Wallace's approach apart, I think. Okay. He embeds analysis into every single phase of that MCD process. Wow. Because think about it the needs of the business, yeah, they can change constantly, right? Oh, yeah. The learners, what they need, yeah, absolutely, can change. Yeah. You need to be ready to adapt, adapt the training. Yeah, it's like that old saying, right? No plan survives contact with the enemy. You've got to be ready to adjust and adapt. Precisely. And we need to avoid getting bogged down in details that sound interesting, but don't actually help people perform better. Wallace calls these seductive details. Oh, seductive details. Yeah, and they can really be detrimental to the training's effectiveness. It's like adding, I don't know, glitter to a birthday cake. Yes. It might look pretty, but it doesn't make it taste any better. Exactly. Love the analogy. So you've laid the groundwork. You've done some initial analysis. Right. Now we move into the design phase. Okay. So this is where we start building the actual training, right? Yeah. Talking, format, activities, the way the information flows, all that good stuff. You got it. But yeah. there's a twist. Okay. Remember how we said this is all about performance? Right. Yeah. Well, Wallace is a huge advocate for designing backward. Backwards. Yeah. Okay. You're going to have to... Um, explain this one sure it sounds a little counterintuitive so instead of starting with the content you want to teach you start with the end in mind okay what are those specific actions those outcomes that you want to see on the job okay so you design the assessments first you design the assessments the exercises all that practical stuff first then you build the information and the demonstrations around those activities so you're basically like flipping the script right exactly you start with what people need to do and then you build the training backwards from there that's it and it ensures that every single piece of content, every activity, directly contributes to those desired performance outcomes. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Right. So we've we've designed our training with those performance outcomes front and center. Yes. What comes next? Next up are uh, the more, I guess, traditional phases, development, okay. pilot testing, and revision and release. So development, that's where... you 
you're actually creating the materials, right? Exactly. Whether it's like mm -hmm. online modules, facilitator guides, job aids, all that stuff. All of that. Mm -hmm. And Wallace has some interesting advice for this stage too. He's all about starting with what he calls an alpha version. Alpha version. Basically like a rough draft alpha. of your training materials. Gotcha. He believes in getting feedback early and often. Okay. And who better to give feedback than those master performers we keep mentioning. Right. They can, you know, they can help make sure that the content is accurate and like, you know, maybe more importantly, capture those subtle details and yeah. tricks of the trade that often, you know, get missed. Absolutely. Those lessons from Hades, as Wallace calls them. Lessons from Hades. Yes. yes. The things that trip people up in the real world. Right. But you know, might not be obvious to someone who's been doing the job for years. Yeah, it's like tapping into that hidden knowledge yeah. that like doesn't make it into the manuals or the presentations, you know. Exactly. Love it. Okay, so we've got our alpha version. It's packed with all those insider tips. Yes. What happens next? It's time for pilot testing. And Wallace has a very specific approach in mind. A full destructive test. Okay. Full destructive test. That sounds kind of intense. I know, right? What does that actually entail? Are we talking crash test dummies and simulations gone wrong? Not quite as dramatic as it sounds, I promise. Okay. Essentially, it means putting your training through the ringer. Mm -hmm. You know, like trying to break it, find any weaknesses, any areas for improvement before you release it to the world. So it's like a final dress rehearsal, but instead of politely applauding yes. the audience is encouraged to like be brutally honest yes and point out every single flaw that feedback is pure gold because it sets you up perfectly for the final phase which is revision and release okay so that's where you incorporate all that feedback yes. polish it up and then you know finally unleash it that's right but it doesn't just end there does it you know wallace it's all about continuous improvement right he stresses that the analysis doesn't stop at release it's about constantly monitoring for those errors of fact, yeah, so those errors of omission, even those pesky errors of inclusion, you know, the stuff that snuck in there, even though it shouldn't have. Oh, yeah. And those uh, lessons learned exercises he talks about, that's a key part of that. Absolutely. It's about taking the time to reflect as individuals and as a team on what worked, what didn't, yeah. what you do differently next time, because there's always a next time. So we've covered a lot of ground here. We have. From why performance-based training matters to this whole MCD framework. Right. Even this, you know, crazy idea of a full destructive test. Full destructive test. But I feel like there's still more to uncover here. There is. And this is where things get really interesting. Okay. Wallace connects all of this back to the bigger picture of, like, organizational performance. Yeah. He argues that effective training, it isn't just about individual development. It's about driving those real business results. So it's not just about making people smarter. It's about making the entire organization smarter. Yes. More efficient. Yes. More successful. Exactly. And he doesn't just talk the talk. He provides a really practical framework for achieving that. Okay. It all starts with aligning the training with what he calls critical business issues. So these are like the... Uh, the things that are keeping the higher-ups up at night, right? Yeah. Those make-or-break issues for the organization. Right. The things that are really going to move the needle on their bottom line. Exactly. And Wallace argues that this alignment needs to be driven from the top down. You need buy-in from what he calls the stakeholders with command and control. Okay. Those who have the authority and the resources to make change happen. Right, it's about getting those decision makers on board, making them see the value, you know, the ROI of a truly effective training program. Absolutely, and that's where his instructional request intake process mm -hmm. comes in. Okay. It's a two-stage process designed to really scrutinize those training requests. So instead of just saying yes to every single training request, they're encouraged to, you know, ask the tough questions. Exactly. Like, uh, is training really the answer here? Yes. Or can we quantify the impact this is going to have on the business? And get this. He even provides this crazy detailed customer stakeholder interview guide to help navigate those conversations. We're talking delving into the purpose, the background, the scope, even the approach for the requested training. He's not messing around. No, he's not. It's about like being thorough 
You're you know, clear. making sure everyone is crystal clear on the need before you even start like sketching out solutions. And that attention to detail, that laser focus on crystal clear communication. Yeah. It's woven throughout his entire approach. It's like he's like he's mapped out every single pitfall, yeah. every potential roadblock, and then provided like this clear roadmap for navigating them. He's basically the Indiana Jones of instructional design. Right. And this is especially crucial when you're dealing with, you know, those high stakes performance uh, situations right. where the risks and the rewards are, you know, magnified. You can't just wing it. Right. You got to do your due diligence. You've got to. Make sure that training is going to deliver. Exactly. And speaking of delivering, Wallace seems particularly passionate about this idea of transfer. Ah, uh, yes. Transfer. Right. The holy grail of training, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Right. Making sure that what is learned in the training room, you know, it, it doesn't just evaporate the second they walk out that door. I know. It's something that so many organizations struggle with. I know. You can have the most brilliant, engaging, mind-blowing training in the world. Yeah. But if people aren't using what they've learned back on the job. Right. What's the point? What is the point? You're right. And Wallace is the first to admit that transfer isn't just about the training itself. Okay. It's about the environment those learners are returning to. Oh, okay. He talks about this idea of uh, culture and consequences, this notion that managers need to create a space that actually supports yeah. and reinforces those new skills and behaviors that people learned. So it's not enough to just like send people to training and just like hope for the best. Right. Hope is not a strategy. You need to create a culture where, you know, continuous learning and improvement are like celebrated. They're embedded into the organization itself. Absolutely. And this kind of culture shift. Yeah. That's a conversation that needs to happen at the very top. For sure. You need leaders to champion this idea. Yes. They need to like role model these behaviors, well, yeah, so create an environment where learning is seen as an investment, not an interruption. And that's where Wallace's courage to tackle these like tough conversations yeah. it really shines through yes he doesn't shy away from you know challenging the status quo he's encouraging instructional designers to push back to advocate for their learners and to work collaboratively with stakeholders to create an environment where transfer isn't just this like pipe dream right but it's an expected outcome he wants us to be more than just instructional designers he wants us to be consultants yeah advisors change agents yes i love that it's about like stepping into that role of trusted advisor you know yes working alongside those leaders to shape that culture of learning and performance absolutely and he walks the talk offering really practical tips for facilitating those conversations, mm -hmm. for keeping everyone engaged and and focused on those outcomes. He's like that friend, you know, who doesn't just give great advice, right. but also yeah. tells you exactly how to, like, put it into action. Exactly. He even stresses the importance of being declarative. I'll admit I had to look that one up. I did, too. But it's actually quite simple, right? It is. It's just being upfront about your intentions, right. stating your expectations clearly, making sure there's no room for misinterpretation. Yeah. He also talks about being redundant by design. Design. Okay, so that one sounds a little counterintuitive. I know. But I think I get it. Sometimes you need to like repeat yourself, reiterate those key points just to make sure that like everyone's on board. Absolutely. It's like that saying, tell me what you're going to tell me. Yes. Tell me and then tell me what you told me. Exactly. And this ties into his whole, you know, philosophy of going slow to go fast. Yes. Like taking the time to get things right from the outset, even if it, you know, feels tedious. Right. Will ultimately save you so much time and effort in the long run. Absolutely. And his meticulousness, yeah. his attention to detail. Yeah. It's evident in everything he does. It really is. He even talks about the importance of like writing things down, of creating a visual representation of the conversation. Oh, that's so smart. Right. Especially when you're dealing with like complex information right. or multiple perspectives. It's about creating that shared understanding, a single source of truth that everyone can refer back to. And he's not afraid to like inject a little humor into the mix, which I think oh, I love that about it can be such a lifesaver, you know, yeah, yeah. especially in those high pressure situations oh, it's like a well-placed joke can diffuse tension. It can build rapport. It can make everyone like feel a little bit more human. Right? Absolutely. But he also emphasizes the importance of, you know, maintaining control of the conversation, making mm. sure that it stays productive and focused. So it's about striking that balance, right? Yeah. Between being like 
approachable and friendly, but also being, you know, firm and assertive, yes. making sure the conversation stays on track and actually achieves those objectives. He even have tips for like the really nitty gritty details of like how to run those facilitated sessions. Oh, really? Like making sure your handwriting is legible on a flip chart, you know? Okay, yeah. And to be wary of groupthink. It's like he's thought of everything uh, from like the big picture stuff. Yes. Like aligning training with those strategic business goals. Yes. All the way down to those tiny details that can like make or break a meeting. Totally. And and his meticulousness is really evident in how he breaks down the different roles and responsibilities mm. involved in this whole MCD process. Right. Like he's created a system for everything. Yeah. Which I think is really helpful. Especially for someone like new to instructional design, right? Absolutely. Or for organizations that are just looking to revamp their approach to training. Right. He really does provide that clear roadmap for making that transition. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he even goes like really deep into the weeds he does. of different analysis techniques. He compares, you know, the more traditional approach, you know, the interviews, the observations, reviewing all those documents right. to what he calls the um, facilitated group process. Yeah, the facilitated group process. And he helps you like decide which approach is best. Which is so helpful. For your particular project needs. Yeah. I was especially intrigued by his explanation of the um, 70-30 knowledge gap. Oh, yeah. The 70-30 knowledge gap. Yes. It's this idea that even those like superstar performers. Wait, the ones at the top of their game. Yeah. They often struggle to actually articulate a huge chunk of what they actually do. It's wild, right? It is wild. It's like they've internalized so much of their knowledge and expertise, yeah. but they don't even realize it anymore. Right. It's like trying to explain you know, how to tie your shoes. It's just something you do. You don't think about the steps involved. Exactly. And Wallace, he offers some like really practical strategies for bridging that gap. Yes. For uncovering that hidden knowledge and translating it into training that, you know, actually sticks. Because at the end of the day, it's not just about analyzing performance. Right. It's about designing training that actually helps people improve. And that's where his, you know, insights into instructional design, like, really shine through yes he has so much to say about how to structure the training itself right how to make it engaging how to make it effective yes and most importantly how to make it stick and he's a huge proponent of modularization modularization yeah basically breaking down the training into smaller more digestible chunks it's like building with legos i love that you can mix and match those modules to meet the needs of different learners oh, okay different situations and i'm guessing this ties back into his emphasis on like tailoring the training to the specific needs of the learners right, right? exactly because not everyone learns the same way. Right, exactly. Uh, at the same pace. And by creating these smaller, more focused modules, you give learners more control over their own learning experience. They can focus on the areas where they need the most support and they can skip over the stuff they already know. It's about like respecting people's time, right? Yeah. Recognizing that everyone kind of comes to the table with different experiences, different learning styles. It's about creating like a more personalized and ultimately more effective learning journey. And that flexibility is so crucial in today's, you know, rapidly changing work environment. Oh, yeah. People need to be able to access training when and where they need it. Yeah. And be able to, you know, immediately apply what they've learned. So it's not just about what you teach, but how you teach it. Precisely. Wallace encourages instructional designers to, you know, to carefully consider the most effective instructional mode for each module. Okay, so we're talking about things like traditional classroom-based training, online modules. Yes, yes. Even coaching and mentoring. All of that. It's about choosing the method that best suits the content and the learners. Right. It's about recognizing that one size does not fit all. Exactly. I love how he um how he really dives into the like the nitty-gritty of designing those hands-on um application exercises. Oh yes. The activities that really help learner like really cement their understanding yes. and then apply what they've learned in, you know, practical context. He makes a really important distinction between, you know, real work, simulated real work, and then those talk through exercises. So it's about finding that sweet spot between like authenticity yes. and then like practicality. Yes, exactly. You want the exercises to be as realistic as possible. Right. But you also have to consider things like, you know, time constraints. Yeah. Well, right. Available resources. Right. Those are always limitations. Always. It's about making those strategic trade-offs to make sure those exercises are both 
engaging for those learners and effective in actually like achieving those learning objectives. I also love how he emphasizes the importance of incorporating um, demonstrations or demos yeah. into the learning process. Oh, yes. Showing, not telling. Right. Give people a clear model of what good performance looks like. Yeah. And he encourages instructional designers to be creative with those demos, right? Yeah, yes. We're talking like live demonstrations, mm -hmm. videos, sure. even just a series of well-crafted graphics. It's about finding the most effective way to visually represent that information. Absolutely. And he stresses the importance of aligning those demos with the application exercises. Okay. So learners can see that clear connection between the theory and the practical application. It's about creating a more like seamless and integrated learning experience. Exactly. Where everything builds on itself. And speaking of building, Wallace is a big fan of what he calls levels when it comes to those application exercises. Okay, tell me more about these levels. He suggests that you start with those easy peasy tasks. Easy peasy. You know, just the ones that build confidence and get people comfortable with the basics. Right, okay. And then as those learners progress, you gradually ramp up that complexity, uh, eventually leading them to, you know, those Mission Impossible challenges. So it's like um, it's like those video games where you start at level one. Exactly. And then you work your way up, right? Yes. <laughs> Mastering new skills. Yeah. Facing tougher challenges as you go. It's a great way to, like, keep learners engaged. Exactly. And it prevents them from feeling overwhelmed, right? Right. Right. But it's not just about making things, you know, progressively harder. It's about incorporating those desirable difficulties we talked about. Right. Remember those. The brain bending challenges that actually enhance learning and retention. Yes. How do those fit into the, um, the levels approach? Well, Wallace suggests incorporating them throughout the different levels. Yeah. You know, using a variety of those techniques to kind of keep learners on their toes. Okay. So we're talking things like, uh, varying the practice conditions, mm -hmm. forcing people to recall information from memory okay. without referring back to their notes, maybe even like throwing in a few curveballs. So it's about like keeping things fresh. Or... Keep those brains firing. Yeah, preventing boredom this and ensuring way. those learners are like actively engaging with the material. Yes. Not just passively absorbing it. Exactly. It's about creating those aha moments, you know, those moments of insight and discovery that lead to lasting learning. Love it. And speaking of making learning stick, Wallace has a lot to say about choosing the right instructional mode for each module. He does. He really encourages instructional designers to consider that full spectrum of options. Okay. From, you know, your traditional group-paced instruction to those self-paced online modules to even incorporating elements of coaching and mentoring. So it's about recognizing that there's no, like, one-size-fits-all. There isn't. Yeah. The most effective method really depends on the content, the learning objectives, the learners themselves. Right. And the context, you know, yeah. where they'll be applying those skills. It's about meeting learners where they are. It's exactly. not where we think they should be. And it's about recognizing that sometimes the most effective training happens outside of, like, a traditional classroom setting. Absolutely. And this is where those job aids come in. Okay, yeah. Those on-the-job performance support tools. Let's talk more about job aids okay. because they sound incredibly practical. They are. Especially in those, like, high-stakes performance situations, you yeah. know, right. where people need, like, access to information and guidance, like, in the moment. And it can take so many forms. Okay. Depending on the needs of those learners and the tasks. Mm -hmm. Two seconds. Checklists flow charts, step-by-step -step guides, right. even like quick reference cards or online tutorials. So it's about providing like those just-in-time reminders yes. and support mechanisms to kind of help people bridge that gap right, exactly. between what they learned in the training room and how they actually apply those skills in the real world. And the beauty of job aids is that they're designed to be so easily accessible. Right. They're readily applicable to like the specific tasks that they're performing. Okay, so we're like convinced performance-based training is the way to go. Yes. But how do we actually do it? You know? Right. Wallace talks about this thing called the performance model. Yes. And it sounds like this is kind of where the rubber meets the road, right? It is. The performance model, it's key. It's like a detailed map. But instead of showing streets, it shows you the ideal performance for like a specific job. Okay. And crucially, it helps you identify those gaps Correct. between, you know, where people are now and where they need to be. Okay. I'm intrigued. Break it down for me. Like, how does this performance model actually work? It's surprisingly elegant, actually. Okay. It starts by dividing performance into what Wallace calls um, 
Areas of performance, AOPs. Areas of performance, okay. Yes, think of them as like those major buckets of activity that make up a job. So for our call center example, an AOP might be something like um, resolving customer issues or um, exactly. closing sales effectively, something like that. Exactly, and within each AOP, the performance model then dives into like the real nitty gritty, okay. outlining the specific measurable uh, results that, that those activities need to achieve. Okay. Wallace calls those outputs. Outputs. So for like resolving customer issues, an output might be um, resolved customer issue within five minutes or something like that. Yes. And keeping that customer satisfaction score high. Right. Of course. Yes. Got to keep those customers happy. Exactly. And it goes even deeper outlining, you know, the tasks someone needs to perform to achieve those outputs, mm -hmm. the measures you use to evaluate their performance, even like who the key stakeholders are, the people who actually care about the results. So it's like a blueprint for success. It is. It maps out every step of the process yeah. and who's involved. Exactly. And here's where the gap analysis comes in. Okay. So by comparing this ideal performance, you know, as laid out in the performance model mm -hmm. to what's actually happening on the ground, yeah. that's how you pinpoint exactly where the training needs to focus. Okay, so it's like holding up that blueprint to the to the construction site and saying, okay, yeah. we're supposed to have a wall here, but right now there's just this giant hole. I love that analogy. Yes. Yeah. And this is where those um, lessons from Hades right. that we talked about. Those insider tips. Yes. The workarounds. All that. Exactly. That only comes from experience. They come from those master performers oftentimes. Right. Exactly. The people who are already like killing it on the job. Yeah. So by talking to them you uncover those you know seemingly minor details right. that make a huge difference yeah. in real world performance yeah. it's about capturing those unwritten rules the tricks of the trade yes it's like it's like giving those learners a secret weapon you yeah. know yes. like a cheat sheet for navigating those like those tricky situations right. that you know you can only like learn through experience exactly but it's not about you know, shortcuts. Right. It's about giving them the knowledge and skills they need to actually like handle those situations effectively. Mm -hmm. And that's where the knowledge and skill analysis comes in. Right. So we've mapped out that ideal performance. We've identified those those gotchas, those lessons from Hades. Right. Now we need to like figure out what what knowledge, what skills do people actually need? Exactly. What do they need to know? Right. What do they need to be able to do to perform those actions successfully? So we're essentially like creating a learning roadmap. Yes. It's a detailed outline of all that knowledge and all those skills that someone needs to acquire yes. to reach those those performance goals that we've set. Precisely. And Wallace offers a really clear, structured process yeah. for actually doing this. Okay. He even breaks down knowledge and skills into different categories. He does. He lists like 17 different categories, I think. It's a lot. Covering everything from like marketplace knowledge right, to yeah. interpersonal skills yeah, to technical expertise, like all of it. It's comprehensive to say the least. But that's what I appreciate about his approach. Yeah. He leaves no stone unturned, you know? Yeah. It's it's systematic, it's intentional, and it helps you avoid those like vague, haphazard training programs. Yes, the ones that just like throw information right. at people and hope for the best. Yeah, exactly. Which we know doesn't really work. Right, it's not about just checking boxes. No. It's about creating a really like laser focused learning experience yeah. that like equips people with the exact knowledge and skills that they need to actually like Excel. Couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah. And this, like this systematic approach, it extends to how he thinks about structuring the training. Okay, so that's where um, that's where the modular curriculum development framework yeah, yeah, or so MCD so comes yeah. back into play. Exactly. Yeah. It provides that roadmap for designing each of those individual training modules. Right. Those bite-sized chunks of learning. Exactly. Okay. And one of the key principles that he emphasizes is the importance of designing those modules. Uh, backwards. Yes. Right. You got it. It's about starting at the end. Okay. With that desired performance outcome. Yeah. And working backwards. Okay. So before you even think about creating like a PowerPoint presentation mm -hmm. or recording a video or whatever it is, yes. you need to like really clearly define those performance objectives yeah. and then design those assessments and exercises that will like demonstrate mastery of them. Precisely. And then you start crafting that content. Right. You know, the information, the mm -hmm. demonstrations, all of that, mm -hmm. the activities, all of that supports 
the assessments and the exercises. It's such a different way of it's thinking a, about like training design. It is. It forces you to like be so laser focused on it, those outcomes. Exactly. It ensures that every single element of that training serves a very specific purpose. Yes. And contributes to those ultimate performance goals that we've set. It maximizes both the learner's time. Right. And the organization's investment. Right. Because time is money, as so, they say. Exactly. And he even suggests breaking down those application exercises into different levels. Yes, he does. Right. So you can create more of a gradual and I imagine like less intimidating yes. learning curve. He talks about creating that range of levels, you know, from those easy peasy tasks. Right. The easy peasy. Yes. Just to build that confidence. Right. And then you work up to those Mission Impossible challenges. Right. Where they're really like having to apply exactly. everything that they've learned. Yes. In a more like, you know, complex and demanding scenario exactly like that classic video game model right yes you level up as you go gain new skills you face tougher challenges it's a great way to you know yes. keep people motivated like provide that sense of accomplishment as they're oh. moving through it exactly it makes that learning process yeah more engaging more rewarding right but we can't forget about those uh desirable difficulties yeah, yes those brain boosting challenges the brain boosting challenges yes. that might make learners sweat a little bit that's right they're supposed to but ultimately lead to like you know deeper learning better retention how does wallace suggest we like incorporate those into the mix well he's got a few tricks up his sleeve okay he talks about varying the practice conditions you know forcing learners to recall information from memory right without like constantly going back to their notes Oh, okay. Maybe introduce some unexpected challenges just to keep them on their toes. Right. So it's about it's about keeping things like fresh, you know, fresh, it. preventing that boredom and making yeah. sure that learners are like actively engaging yes. with the material, not just, you know, passively absorbing it. Exactly. It's about creating those like those aha moments. Yes. Those moments of like, you know, insight and discovery right. that lead to lasting learning. And speaking of making learning stick. Wallace has uh, a lot to say about choosing, you know, that right instructional mode yes. for each module. He does. He encourages us to really consider that full spectrum of options oh. from your traditional, like, group-paced instruction yeah. to self-paced online modules mm -hmm. to even incorporating those elements of coaching and mentoring. So it's about recognizing that one size one size does not fit all. Does not fit all when it comes to training. It does not. Right. And the most effective method, you know, it really depends, right? It really does. On the content. Yep. The learning objectives. The your learners themselves. The context. Wait. Like, all of it. All of it matters. This is where that deep understanding yeah. of your target audience, their existing knowledge, their learning preferences, their work environment. Oh, yeah. It's critical. It's about like meeting learners where they are, Here's not the where you think they should be. Right, exactly. And recognizing that, you know, sometimes the best training happens outside of like that traditional classroom. Absolutely. And this is where those job aids come in. Okay, yes. The job aids. Yes. Those on the job performance support tools. Okay. Let's talk more about job aids because yeah. they sound incredibly practical. They are. Especially in those uh in those high stakes performance situations. Yes. Where people need access to information. Yeah. They need that guidance like in the moment. In the flow of work. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And job aids, they can take so many forms. Okay. Depending on like you know, the learners and their tasks. Oh, We're talking like checklists, flow charts, step-by-step -step guides, mm. even like, you know, just quick reference cards or online tutorials. So it's about providing those like just-in-time reminders and support mm -hmm. mechanisms to help people like bridge that gap, yeah. right? Between yeah. what they learn in the training and then how they actually apply those skills yes. in the real world. And what I love about job aids is that they're designed to be like so readily accessible right, and yeah. applicable to like whatever that task is that they're doing. It's like having a coach or a mentor right. right there beside you, guiding you through those critical moments. Oh, I love that. Yes. It's like creating a safety net. It is a safety net. You're like reducing the cognitive load yeah. and really like setting people up for success when yeah. it matters most. That's right. But these job aids, they're not something you just like slap together at um, the last minute. Right. Absolutely not. Wallace really stresses that the creation of job aids 
that should be a core part okay. of your instructional design process. Okay, so you're thinking about those job aids from the very beginning. Yes. During those analysis phases, the send design yeah. phases, yes. making sure that they align with those performance objectives and the you know target audience's needs. Exactly. It's about adopting that holistic mindset. Right. You know, recognizing that training isn't just about delivering information. Right. Mm -hmm. It's about creating a comprehensive support system yes. that equips people to perform at their best. And that support system, it extends beyond like the training materials themselves. Right? It does. It's about creating a culture, you yeah. know, yeah. where where learning is valued. Yes. Where people are encouraged to experiment, to take risks. Yes. And where those mistakes are seen as like opportunities for growth, not reasons for like but, punishment. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And creating that kind of culture yeah. that requires a real shift in mindset. It does. And not just from the learners themselves, but from those managers. Right. The leaders, the organization as a whole. It's about creating like a learning organization, yes. a place where continuous improvement, development, like yeah. that's just woven into how you do things. Yes. And that kind of brings us back to that that key question. Right. How do we actually make this happen? That is the million dollar question. Right. And lucky for us, right. Wallace doesn't just leave us hanging. No, he doesn't. He gives us a ton of practical advice and guidance. He does. For like, how do you align those training initiatives with the the big business goals. Yes. How do we get buy-in? Yes. How do we create a culture that really like embraces this? So we're talking about like a pretty big shift here, right? It is. Moving away from that like old school sit and get training mentality. Right. To something that's like far more strategic, far more impactful. Yeah. And it's not just about, you know, changing the training itself. It's about changing how the whole organization thinks about like Training and development, right? Exactly. And this is where those uh, stakeholders with command and control, okay. those decision makers at the top. Right. They're important. They play such a like crucial role. Right. Wallace argues that their buy-in, it's essential for actually creating a culture yeah. where this right. kind of performance-based training can thrive. Because they're the ones who, you know, control the purse strings. They do. Right. They're the ones who decide where the resources go, what gets prioritized, all of that. Exactly. But it's not just about the money. It's about creating that environment, that that culture where learning is seen as like strategically important. Right. Not just a dox to be checked. Right. And this is where Rawlis's um, emphasis on aligning training with uh, those, you know, critical business issues. Right. It's so important. Yeah. It's about making that connection right between the training and those big like organizational goals. Yes. Demonstrating that investing in training, it's not just about like developing those individuals. It's about yeah. driving like those exactly. real measurable business results. Exactly. And Wallace provides a really practical framework for doing exactly that. OK. He talks about the importance of having this like really clear instructional request intake process. So instead of just like saying yes to every single training request that comes their way, you know, organizations need to be a little more discerning, more strategic about about what they invest in. Absolutely. Ask the hard questions up front. Is training really even the right solution? Right. What What are those specific performance outcomes we want? How will we actually measure success? All of those things. It's about being like more intentional. Yes. More data driven, you know, yeah. in how we approach like training and development. Precisely. Yeah. And Wallace even provides this like incredibly comprehensive, it's amazing, customer stakeholder interview guide okay. to help with those conversations. Tell me a little bit more about that guide. What kind of questions does it cover? It's so thorough. We're talking about diving deep into the purpose, yeah. the background, the scope, mm -hmm. even the proposed um, approach. You know? So you're leaving no stone unturned. No. Hmm. You've got to make sure that everyone is on the same page right? You know about the problem, those desired outcomes, mm -hmm. You know how you're going to get there. It's like they say measure twice, Cut once. Yeah, exactly. And it's like that attention to detail, yes. that commitment to clarity and alignment. It's like woven throughout, you know, his whole methodology. Well, absolutely. It's like he's anticipated every like possible pitfall, like every communication breakdown, every moment of like ambiguity yes. and giving you that clear roadmap. He has. He has. And that's especially important when you're dealing with those uh, 
high stakes performance situations. Nah, of course, of course. Yeah. Where the risks are high, oh. but the rewards are even higher. Even higher. So, you know, you can't afford to be like haphazard. No, you can't. Or, or like messy in your approach. Yeah. You know, you need a proven system. You need that framework you do, you do, to yeah. guide you, you know, every step of the way. And that's essentially what Wallace has created, right? Yeah. This really comprehensive performance-based methodology yes. for, you know, designing, developing, yes. delivering training that yeah. actually makes a difference. I think you hit the nail on the head. And, you know, one thing that really struck me as like incredibly practical okay. yeah. was his um his concept of existing training and development assessment or ETA as yeah. he calls it. Oh, yes. ETA. Love it. It's this idea of like taking a really good look at what you already have, right? right. Any training materials that already exist before yeah. you even think about starting from scratch. It's amazing how often we like forget to do that, right? It is. We just jump in and want to reinvent the wheel. Yeah, it's like that that classic saying. Yes. Work smarter, not harder. Exactly. Wallace is all about efficiency. He wants you to, you know, leverage what you have yes. whenever possible. Absolutely. And he doesn't just you know, throw out this idea of ETA. Right, right. He actually gives you a very detailed process okay. for actually conducting this assessment. So, you know, you're really systematically going through yes. evaluating those materials, determining, okay, are these good to go as is? Right, as is. Or do they need a little, you know, sprucing up, updating? A little TLC. Yeah, a little TLC. <laughs> or do we really need to start from scratch here? Exactly. You got to be resourceful. You yeah. Know? Be good stewards of the organization's resources. I love that. And he even suggests like looking beyond your own organization's walls, you know. Oh, yes. Maybe there's already something out there that, yeah. that you can, you know, purchase right. from a vendor or a consultant or something like that. Be open to all the possibilities. Yes. Sometimes the best solution is, you know, partnering with someone yeah. who has already created something amazing. It's about being strategic being open-minded and and really just prioritizing, you know, that's, what's best for the learner. Of course, that's always number one. And the organization. And that's like that's what I appreciate so much yes. about Wallace's work. He's so pragmatic. Yeah. Results oriented. So as we kind of wrap up this deep dive, you know, into Guy Wallace's world of, uh, you know, performance-based instructional design. Yeah. What would you say is like the Biggest takeaway. The biggest takeaway. Yeah, for our listeners, you know. I think for me, it all comes back to this. Training is not an event. Training is a process. Yeah. It's this ongoing journey. Right. Continuous improvement. It needs to be treated as such. Yeah. It's about moving away from those traditional models, you know, yeah. that treat it as this like one time thing. Like, yeah. OK, I went to the training. Yes. Check Pick the box. Right. <laughs> it's like <laughs> embracing a much more like holistic. Yes. Performance based approach. A hundred percent. Aligning it with those business goals mm -hmm. measuring its impact, creating a culture. Right. Right. It's about making training not just a cost center, but like a strategic driver of success. Yes. Absolutely. And that's a goal worth striving for. It is. So as you head back out into the world, you know, I encourage you to like reflect on those systems and those support structures that, yeah. that Wallace talks about. What can you do, you know, within your sphere of influence yes. to to really foster this like this culture of of performance based training? Yes. How can you help bridge that gap between, you know, the learning and those and those real world results? It's a question we should all be asking ourselves. Indeed. Thank you so much for uh, for joining us on this uh, deep dive. Oh, this is so fun. Into the world of performance-based instructional design. Yes. Until next time, <laughs> keep learning, keep growing, keep striving for mastery. I love it.